Hello, everyone. Welcome at the Innovation Cafe. Um, we have two speakers for you today. We're going to start with a talk by Patricia Basley. I'm saying it right, right? Yeah, on positive psychology. And afterwards, we're going to have a talk uh, by Yves Dupuy about uh, botanical perfumes. Um, about the Innovation Cafe, we're a weekly uh, networking event where we always uh, uh, provide talks as well. So we have some content and afterwards we're going to continue talking with a drink and a bite. Um, I will get back to you a little bit on that. Uh, but every week uh, we provide content based on either tech or design or knowledge um, and uh, to show you what's happening all around Eindhoven and abroad. Um, so we're always talking in English uh, because we want to include everyone. And um, yeah, so we're having breakouts or workshops or discussions, basically anything. Um, if you're interested in providing something yourself, please let me know uh, and we can discuss it. But for now, I want to give the word to Patricia. So please come up to the stage. Thanks for your introduction. Um, I'm Patricia, and I want to talk about mindset and success today. Before that, I want to quickly introduce myself. Um, I have my own business. I just founded my own business called Karuna, the digital life coaching app. I uh, built a lot of expertise in the last years about personal development and growth. That's really my passion. I have a background in business and marketing, and my mission is to rethink life coaching and open doors for aspiring men and women to uh, get coaching, to get personal development, even though you might not have the resources, the time, or the budget to do it. Before I want to dive into the science and uh, start a talk, I want to talk about why this is relevant. And I had my personal experiences with this topic, and it looked a little bit like this chaos, ups and downs, backs and uh, rights and lefts. And um, I posed myself the question, what success is, what success means, and how we can be successful the first time when I started working in a large corporate. Young graduate, eager to climb the ladder, and then you finally realize my studies and education really didn't prepare me for the work life that you are facing. So I started to really become obsessed with that topic, dive into that topic and read every book on earth about it and talk to people. And what I found out is that we live in a very strange world. There are so many talented people, men and women out there with beautiful visions, doing great work, but everybody is kind of stuck and unhappy, stuck with anxiety, um, unhappiness, fear, not really knowing what you can do with your potential and how you can use it. And I want to back this, my personal experience, up with a little bit of facts to show you the bigger picture and you really show you the challenge we face as a society. So you have 49% of millennials that want to switch their jobs within the next two years. And I think we're not for no reason called the restless generation because we're really searching for purpose and fulfillment but what you see with that number is that we didn't really find our fulfillment yet. And organizations, work life is not giving us what we need either. Then you have this incredible number that 50% of the Dutch population works um, part-time, which is beautiful that you have this here as an offer in the Netherlands, much easier than, for example, in Germany where I come from. But it also got me thinking that if half of the population is using that model, then maybe something is wrong with the main model. Also, really striking is that 25% of the population suffer from depression or anxiety, according to European World Health Organization, and 60 to 80% of the doctor's visits are strongly related to mental health. So I think this all really shows us that we are facing a challenge right now and it's something we have to solve because it cannot go on like this. Who can identify a little bit with what I said, experiencing anything personally, but also maybe with your colleagues, in your, with your friends, in your family circles? 
Yeah, a few hands. Good. I can, I can go on. Good. So, as I said, I dived into my own research and really was meant to find a solution, meant to find an answer to what is success, how can we be successful, what, it, it, what is it actually, and found three striking concepts. And I want to quickly talk about these concepts and then also um, show you the model I defined for myself and for my business and how I work. So the first thing is positive psychology. And I love positive psychology because it is about how we make good people even better. Classical psychology is all about healing, sickness, about negativity, about when somebody is ill or sick, how we can heal them. But positive psychology looks at people in a neutral way and assesses their potential and thinks, how can we make you even better? So it's about nurturing strength. It's about building talent. And that's really beautiful. It's really what we need. So uh, founding father of positive psychology is Martin, Selig Martin Seligman. You can check him out. He has also a very nice TED talk. And one of the fundamental principles about positive psychology is gratitude. And I know gratitude is sometimes a little bit hmm, stigmatized. So saying I'm grateful for my coffee in the morning and that makes me more successful. I don't really get the connection. But the underlying concept of gratitude and being grateful is seeing abundance instead of scarcity. And that's the important thing. Training our mind that we see positive things, that we see the positive things in our life instead of all the negative. It's like when you want to buy a car or a bike or something and you suddenly start to see this very thing everywhere. That's what you want to do with your mind. Train it so you see the positive instead of the negative. The next concept is neuroscience. And I think for every skeptic, skeptic person out there, neuroscience is really great because this is super science-based. It's really tangible. It's about the brain. So for everyone that is not that familiar with the brain, we have uh, two hemispheres, right and left hemisphere, working together to create our reality we live in. And that's also already an interesting point that our brain, our mindset creates the real reality we live in. That also means that anything you look at, anything in your surrounding has no inherent meaning unless you give it meaning, positive or negative. So the right brain is all about the present moment. Our senses uh, get in information, create the present moment, our consciousness. It's uh, things and pictures and it is in the present. The left brain instead is in the past and in the future. It picks information from the now, tries to associate it with information from the past and projects it into the future, assessing any possibilities that might happen. It thinks in language and it is the I part, the ego part, the thinking part of the brain. And maybe you're already thinking, hmm, okay, maybe I'm a little bit stuck in my left brain. And that's actually Kind of true, because we're trained as a society to be very active in our left brain. We work at the computers, we think all day, we try to be logic. Logic is kind of valued over everything. So there is a very interesting neuroscientist, Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor, and she had a stroke. And she has a TED talk, and it's really, really amazing, because she, as her education allowed her to be present and conscious during her stroke and understand what happened. And you should really watch the video. It makes me cry every time. But it's a beautiful explanation how our right and left brain hemisphere impact our life, how we see the world, our uh, assessing of the past and the future, and how we should train and be more in the present moment. The next concept is mindfulness and meditation. And also mindfulness is a little bit stigmatized because it's kind of a trend word and everybody's doing mindfulness and what does it actually mean? But if you look at the definition of mindfulness, it is really amazing because it means to be present in the moment, really having focused attention and also approaching any situation you have with openness and non-judgmental attitude and with curiosity. And this is actually something really brilliant. I mean, who wouldn't we want to really be focused in the present moment, non-judgmental, just looking at the world and being curious about what it has to offer us. 
So this is uh, Richard Davidson, also a neuroscientist, uh, together with the Dalai Lama. And they did a lot of research about meditation because meditation is normally how you train mindfulness. And they did some brilliant research with brain scans and everything with Buddhist monks, long-term meditators that are really expert in this field. And what they found out is really, really striking. So meditation has a long-term impact on your brain and your, your neural connection. It manages the amygdala, this is the emotional part of the brain, and also manages your DMN, your uh, default mode network. Sounds complicated, but what it actually does, it increases your focus, it makes you more atten attentive, more present in the moment. It helps you to uh, cope with stress, makes you more resilient, increases your overall well-being, and makes you more compassionate towards yourself and others. And I think that's a really important qualities that also help us in our daily life. So bringing these concepts together and uh, bringing that in something you know you can work with, I founded my business and I developed a few steps or kind of a, a model how you can achieve this mindset answering the questions for yourself. What is success? What does it mean and how can you make it work for you? And the three steps are first self-discovery, so learning about yourself. This empowers self-knowledge and this leads to self-fulfillment. And I want to quickly explain the steps to you. So self-discovery is, of course, first understanding where do you stand in that present moment? Where is your status? What does success mean to you? What are your values? Where do you want to be? And this is a really tough question, and it probably takes you a long time to answer this because it's not obvious. What you have to keep in mind is what you really want and what society is telling you. So success, for example, in our culture is strongly correlated with status and money and job and career. But if you look up the definition of success in a dictionary, for example, it just says it's a degree of succeeding, a degree or measure of succeeding, or a um, favorable outcome. So there's nothing about performance or money. Success for you could be maintaining health, being a good part of the community, caring for others, anything you set your mind up to. So your definition of success, together with your values and your goals, is kind of your guidebook. And you can use that guidebook for the part self-knowledge, so walking the talk. When you know what you want, and that's actually also a very difficult step, you have to walk the talk and stick with it. Actually making these decisions that bring you closer to your goals, bring you closer to what you want. And this requires a lot of courage, vulnerability and persistence. It's not easy, especially when you have goals or a definition of success which is not very common or which is not what your friends and family want you to have or see. And the last step, leading to self-fulfillment. So consistently keeping up with your goals, your values, and your personal definition. Staying with it also when shit hits the fan, just being consistent in your vision and standing for it. And also lastly, finding courage and comfort in change. I think we all know that the world is changing so rapidly and so are we. So a lot of pain and a lot of unhappiness also occurs because we cling so much to what we have in our lives and are not ready to let go. So letting go, finding comfort and change is also very, very important to stay in the self-fulfillment. Then I want to open up uh, the discussion and I'm curious to learn about your experiences with that topic, how you see it. Is it something you talk about with your peers, with your friends, or um, what your personal experiences are? So, Doc, uh, I'm, so with this whole resilience training, I'm always conflicted because, um, for example, when you have stress, you can do two, two things. Basically, you can become resilient to stress and uh, change your, uh, your response to stress, but another way is to take away the stress. Yeah. And how do, you how do you think to find a balance? Because I think both are necessary to... Yeah. 
I think um, stress is really an, a very interesting um, concept because um, stress actually is nothing negative or nothing positive. So stress is a reaction of your body to stay alert and to be focused. We use it in all times to not be eaten by a tiger or whatever. And it gives you this adrenaline rush and this um, focus. And in research, they actually found out that depending on how you associate stress, so if stress is negative for you or positive for you, you react differently. So as you say, the kind of how you approach stress and what it is for you is really important because if stress is something positive for you and you say, okay, stress gives me the necessary boost to achieve my goals, to be focused, then um, your body doesn't value it as something negative. And also... The uh, important thing is to get out of that stress mode. So I think that's the problem, that a lot of people stay on that high level of stress and don't get down, and our, people, uh, our body is in constant alert mode. And that's the key, that you recognize how stress feels, manage the stress, approach it with a non-judgmental attitude, and then um, also really actively work on getting down off that stress level. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, just how can you turn a situation around? So uh, what helps you to see the good in a situation, even when it can be a bad one? Do you have an example or...? Yeah, for example, uh, when you get rejected for a job or something, how can you be yeah. um, turning this around to yeah. a good situation with mindfulness or something yeah. like that? Or how can you see that as a success? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually very tough. And I think that goes a little bit to um, what I said at the la in the last slides, finding comfort in change and not clinging to anything. I know it's very tough, of course, if you get rejection. But um, you have to let go of this feeling and let go of this meaning you give to this event because this is the meaning you give to the event. You don't get the job, so this is bad for you. This is a rejection. And maybe just say, okay, this happened to me but I can do nothing about it. So you're kind of then thinking, okay, about the past and what would it mean for the future? So getting into your left brain and worrying, ruminating maybe about it, having negative self-talk, but trying to find that switch, and I know this is very hard, so trying to find that switch going into the present moment, not attaching so much meaning on it, because ultimately it is a bad experience, but ultimately it doesn't help you to get further in your life. It doesn't, if you stay in this negative mode, ruminating, then you're not open enough, not productive enough, and not positive enough to find maybe alternatives. So I think you cannot change what happened, but you can also always change what happens in the future. And you need to have the positive attitude and the positive mindset to find other opportunities for you. Because if you close yourself up, then also you're not able to see any alternatives that may be there. I often find success is really a face-based approach. So if today for me, success, being successful is finding a job, once I find a job, yeah. for me, success definition changes. So how is it possible to constantly be aligned with the mindset and with the goals? Because this goals keeps on changing itself. Yeah, that's true. And also the thing, not only that uh, success is a phase, you also have different levels. You have a, maybe a personal success for a job, but also for family, for private life, etc. And I mentioned these three steps, but what, I, what actually is true is you always find yourself in all of the steps. Because depending on where you are in your life, what you're currently doing, what your focus is, you're either in the discovery, the knowledge, or you're like, oh, this is running great and I'm super happy about it. So um, that's also um, the challenge to, you know, be aligned with all the different moments, the different priorities you have, and the different um, goals and dreams you have. And that is why actually, and I think I didn't say that, uh, or I said, that is why I want to point to the consistency again, because as everything is changing, you need to um, train your mind every day um, consistently, focusing on what you, what you want, your values, etc. Because it's not enough to think about it once and then you put the book aside and you're done. That's not how it, how it works, because everything is changing. So it is a constant training of our thoughts, our minds, 
and also being present and aware to see what changed and maybe if we need to adjust. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you say the concept is very important and uh, I get that, but I think it's, uh, you can compare it with going to the gym or working out. And while there, I feel like I have an instant gratification, um, but with the mindfulness uh, exercises, even though I tried it and I tried it for a few weeks, but I think I never came to the point where I got this like instant gratification, so I always lost it again at the moment where it became stressful, where I should continue doing it. Maybe yeah. you have some tips on uh, continuing at these moments. Yeah, I think um, that's really good. And I think you know, the comparison with the sports and gym is the same. You find um, a sports, a physical activity that fits you. Not everyone likes to go to the gym. Some like yoga, tennis, swimming, whatever. And that's the same. You have to find a method that fits to you. Is it gratitude? Is it meditation? Is it um, some something else, journaling? Um, you have to find the method that works with your daily life with your schedule and what you how you how you live your life same as with going to the gym so i think that's also one of the that's in the self discovery one of the tricky parts what do you want and how do you get there and finding the right method is um, really really complicated that's true i think that's it Okay, cool. Then thanks a lot. If you want to stay in touch uh, through Instagram, LinkedIn, um, check my website out. I also have a workshop next week about women empowerment. So if you're more interested to m learn more about it, then I'll be happy uh, to meet you there. Thank you. If up to you. <laughs> Already. Thank you. Yes. Welcome to you all. Thank you, Patricia, for your interesting talk. Um, before I start the complete story that can be quite complex about fully botanical perfume compositions, uh, I would like to start with introducing myself. Born 1978, so I'm considered old school working with papers for presentations. Um, I started becoming interested in all the different sensory approaches that we'll talk about t tonight when I was at a very young age and absorbed music and fine arts and photography and graphic design um, in a way a little kid does. Later on, I started at the Fine Arts Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Maastricht and I never considered myself a specialist of any kind. I always considered myself as part of the whole scene of all these craftsmen and craftswomen working together to get one big designed future. Um, I discovered uh, Walter Gropius, founder of the Bauhaus, while I was studying in Maastricht. And there's one quote that triggered everything for me to become a creative director and art director, um, especially the sentence, let us wish, conceive, and create the new constructs of the future that will embrace all in one single form. He was referring to architecture. I am referring to the complete future. They said about Bauhaus that Bauhaus redefined what design, design could do for society. That was a manifesto made up in 1919. Now, fast forward to 2020. And I think the question is the same. What design, how we can redefine design and what it can do for society. We do a lot of things. We design a lot of things. We use a lot of sensory input. 
But one thing is often overlooked, misunderstood or forgotten or used in a way that it can be used with its full potential. That's what I call olfactable. It's not actually a word because you don't have a word for smell in this small role of sensory input. They call it smellable, but olfactable. And olfactable is a small bridge to olfactory information, which is abstract, of course. You smell the whole day, whole night, without maybe even considering it an important input that you get. We've worked with our design collective to create um, an understandable, simple explanation why olfactory information is important for the whole full sensory experience. Our company has one of the sayings that we say the future is one big full sensory experience. You can't leave one of the pieces out when you want the whole experience and when you want everything to be memorable. Olfactory information is the ultimate glue for audible, visual, edible, tangible input. We worked with a couple of scientists to fact check everything before we present it on a stage or <laughs> had a design show. So everything you will hear after this part is scientifically proven. Olfactory information can have a lot of forms and by which I mean it's ever present, it's the ultimate glue between the audible, visible, tangible parts. But there's a, there's a big difference that a lot of people don't yet know or understand. And that's the diff difference between botanical and synthetic olfactory information. It's a huge difference. These are two completely different worlds, actually. We work with our own perfume composer, Juliette sitting here taking pictures. Um, Juliette has worked for 17 or 18 years fully botanical with, with, with natural ingredients, 100% botanical natural ingredients, which is the way she works as one of the five or six composers in the world. And it's a very conscious decision not to work with synthetics. And that has a reason, because when you use botanical ingredients, it's a completely different outcome than when using synthetics or mixing botanical and synthetic, synthetics. Excuse me. First, botanical ingredients are extracts from plants. Botanical ingredients include everything from plants, from root to top to branch. Synthetics are a copy of one small part of the whole molecule row that's in the botanical ingredients. So you only get one page of the novel. You maybe know, you, you, you can maybe uh, uh, read the subject matter, but you don't have context. Botanical information is therefore much more complex, but much more information that you receive when you smell it. Synthetics simply cannot do that. It's one dimensional. There's, there's, there's just two less of information to have the same effect as the botanical. The effect is botanical olfactory information does not only get to your brain, it skips the ratio. It's the only information that we get that we, that we can't steer, that we can't think of anything before it's made a memory, before it's put in our brain as a, as a memory, as a very lively memory. Synthetic olfactory information simply can't do that because the information isn't there. It can be a memory, though, 
you can use synthetics to create memories, but they're only big. Botanical memories are the whole story. All the audio, all the visible things, all the tangible things. And that way you can make something memorable with botanical perfume. In this case, we, we, we compose perfume to make the trigger to recall a memory that's lively, that has everything of the full sensory experience in it. Also, science proves that we not only use olfactory information to decide what is what, but also to navigate where we are. I didn't know that until a couple of months ago, which is also an interesting part regarding the botanical aspect. The experience is the huge difference between the botanical and synthetic part. What we do at Some Tales of Perfume is not only use these ingredients individually, we make compositions, which is a whole other story because we always say when finding the right composition, when Juliet is composing, she lets the molecules dance. They, they, they intertwine, they react to each other. You get a different secret recipe when it's a composition. Fully botanical perfume composition. It reacts the same like wine, actually, fully botanical. It's never the same. The harvest is different. The quantity is different. It's different if you get a jasmine from grass or a jasmine from a completely different place. Synthetics are always the same. It's reproducible. It's kind of handy. It comes in handy in commercial terms, but it's also a very boring way <laughs> to produce something that's always the same. So the 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 the, the great part about the botanical approach is that you don't respond um, psychologically to it, but you also respond physiologically to it. You're in contact with nature. That means your whole system responds to something the olfactory information gives you. Also a big, big, big difference between the botanical and the synthetic version of it. This is the question that we ask ourselves every time we make a new installation, a new design, a new project based on these olfactory designs. The impact of fully botanical perfume on well-being and health in leisure living and working environments. This is actually what we're working on. By using the botanical perfume, by using 100% 100, 100 of botanical perfume, there's a proven stimulation of well-being and health in environments. And our challenge is to design environments that are more future-proof than they are designed right now. Back to the beginning, to see everything as a whole. Don't forget to add the right olfactory information to your new building, for example. You have the sick building syndrome that is causing trouble right now because people are getting tired, stressed, have burnouts, headaches, and so on because building, new buildings are designed to, to be air-conditioned and all the things that are supposed to make life work or leisure easier, but they forget to include the natural component that makes it a better place to stay. So actually, what we're designing is bringing the outside back inside and implementing it into the future of architecture. That said, the future of architecture, we call what we do sand architecture. We made an experiment last year on the Milan Design Week. 
which is called Atmos. Atmos is the name of the perfume composition. Atmos is also the name of the installation, the carriers of the perfume composition that we also design ourselves. And we did an experiment. We placed eight big aisles made of travertino stone and Meranti wood and sticks. And the Meranti was infused with 100% botanical perfume. And the Atmos composition Juliet has designed consists of eight different ingredients. And we put each of one ingredient into one of the aisles. So we deconstructed the perfume, put it in a room. When you stood outside the room, you can experience the whole complete composition. And you walked inside, you could experience every ingredient individually and became a composer yourself within the composition. You could walk through and you could connect to one ingredient, two ingredients, physically make your way through the installation and make your own story. Because one of the important things, I haven't mentioned it already, one of the important things about olfactory information is that it's personal. You know the, 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 the scent marketeers, they say, when you put this kind of perfume or olfactory information inside your store, people will buy green shoes. It simply isn't true because people can be influenced by smell in that way that they all do the same thing, that you have the same reaction and response from everyone. Because we all have our own scent diary built up from the day we were born. The one thing we have in common is vanilla. Vanilla is the, the mother, the breast of, of the mother. That's the first thing you will remember when you open your eyes and start breathing and start smelling. And from there on, we all live our different lives. We all have our different connotations and memories and all different kind of experiences that we have when smelling a certain kind of scent again that we re relive. Again, synthetics can also create memories, but they're not as impactful as the one that botanical perfumes do. And synthetics simply can't stimulate health and well-being, and that's the reason we started this company, to make special design installations and applications that make the whole future of full sensory experience more healthy and more of well-being for society. This is a complete installation of Atmos. And the thing we did, and what the scientists we work with were also curious about, was the response. So we put several guest books in the installation piece. And this is just one page, but people have written half the book of replies or what it did to them and how it triggered the recall of memories and personal memories, experiences. There was one man who was living in Milan his whole life and never got out of the city in the past 20 years. And he said, thank you for bringing back these kind of experiences because I don't feel this anymore when living inside of this big, busy city. Um, we also have an installation here in this building in the caserna in the barrel storage it's called omnia also a soundscape and there was a doctor who came in and he said it's like walking through the woods it's very healthy i think i'll advise my patients to come and see your installation because it has the same effect just a few examples of how personal it is how how how, how valuable it can be when done in the right way This is the question that I really have for you, for the Q&A, because um, it's about perception, it's about communication, it's about what smell can do for you, how you realize what it can do when you focus on it. So my question to you 
is, do you smell what I mean? Maybe someone has a question. I, I have many questions, but I try to keep it short. <laughs> that uh, how do you compose uh, the the sense? Because there we are so different people, and of course, like there might be one scent that is good for everyone, but I guess it's it's still different for each one of us. So how what is the the goal? Uh, do you have? one uh, scent that is good for the purpose or you have scents for goals like okay like aromatherapy like this is for well-being this is for stress release this is i'll give the, the microphone to julia she's the technical um yeah it, it depends on the purpose of course and what you want to have what kind of environment i'm, I'm making scent for like uh, atmos I wanted to uh, send which welcomes people, which give them a relaxed feeling. Um, so there were woods in it, you know, like cedar wood, which is really make you feel at home. There were citrus in it that are vibrant and a lot of people recognize. So that's what I did with this. Uh, installation and composition and but it can also be yeah it can be made to measure to how what kind of purpose a building has and then i'll look at, yeah what's been done there what, what is what the people do and and how can i compose something that will you know i don't know in a working environment i can compose something which um, stimulate uh, the brain or in another environment where there is uh, leisure you can I can compose something which makes you feel more relaxed mm -hmm. so that that's the yeah a little bit is that a little bit of an answer to your question yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's very personal then you compose for each and every yeah I can compose purpose, personal so yeah yeah and my other question was, do you, how do you, because Monsieur mentioned that science is measured or scientifically proven. So it's very difficult, of course, to measure the effect. But do you have a method to measure the effect of the scent? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are different ways. Um, we discussed this yesterday uh, about the difference between output and outcome. Um, the output is really the scientific output numbers, diagrams, and so on. <laughs> How many people above 80 years old with a bad smelling, uh, a sense of smell can still relate to uh, um, uh, orange flavor and what it does to them. Um, but outcome is what I've just shown you, the, the guest books of the Atmos installation. Everyone has its own personal connection to some things, but when you read through it, you can find some um, um, uh, general info. I can't find the word overeenkomst. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, com yeah. When you when you compare them, there are a lot, lot of things that are the same. Maybe in different words. It's not a it's not a, a wordy thing. Smell. So we don't have a lot of words for smell in Dutch. We only have one. It's called muff. And the rest we'll have to explain using our hands and feet and mostly referring to taste when we want to explain something that's smellable. That says a lot. Um, uh, we worked with Dr. Ilya Koymans, who does research in all different cultures and what kind of words they have, a vocabulary for smell and taste. Smell is very, the Thai people have half a dictionary full when it comes to smell and the Dutch only have one word. So. Um, but uh, the, the, to answer the question maybe maybe more um, um, directly, um, the, the measurable things are in the brain, and in, in um, the, the, they they measure also the the, the bodily functions, organs. Uh, because uh, the last thing we heard about organs is that they can smell also. Uh, you, you smell with your whole body, 
presumably. Um, <laughs> so the nose is not just the only olfactory receptor there is. Um, but the things in the brain, the EEG uh, info is the most uh, common when used in, in science explaining what smell can do for you and does for your brain and your, uh, uh, your way of behaving or responding to things. But what we create with uh, our perfume compositions and design installations is sort of a context. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, red or blue that you see in front of you when you walk out. It, it's, it's about the context that we can give you to experience something positive in this case. <laughs> you can create a context that's not very positive also, but that's not the purpose of, of what we're doing. So, um, yeah, output can say a lot, but outcome actually says a lot more. So it's, so it's an interesting thing. What we experienced together with the scientists is that there's relatively, um, there's not a lot of research being done. There is a lot of research being done on olfactory information, but compared to the visible, audible, tangible, edible, it's, it's only the tip of the iceberg. So they're still investigating a lot of things that we can answer right now, but what we experience, what we can explain. So it's, an, it's, it's, it's a pioneering thing, <laughs> actually. We learn day by day also. I, I'll, I'll be Thank pleased you. if you walk in here in the Kazana building in the bar barrel storage in the Omnia installation, then, then maybe we can... So we can smell it. Yeah, you, you can smell it. You can smell it. Hello, everyone. Thank you for a great presentation. I am a fan of uh, smell and perfumes myself. I uh, got even as a gift uh, the kit from the grass to try to make it my own, but I, uh, how to say, didn't learn it. I'm just YouTube it and uh, read some books. Mm -hmm. So do you have maybe tips or in Netherlands where is a great um, uh, workshops or, or may maybe tell your story, how you started your journey? And <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, how I started my, my background is I'm a aromatherapist, so my education is aromatherapy, and but I got uh, teached by uh, chemical, how you say that? Chemical analyst. So yeah, so she learned us a lot about the structure, about the essential oils uh, from the plants, but also what they made, which molecules and everything. So it was also really dry uh, material. Mm -hmm. And yeah, next to that also about what they can do for your body physically, mentally. Um, um, so that's where I started. But then I became really interested in compositions. And I started blending. Um, but yeah, uh, I do this for 18 years now. So the tip I can give you is just start by good essential oils and start blending and, and, and write down the information, write down what it does to you. I, I'm an autodidact in, in blending and making perfumes. And it's just doing a lot and, and um, experiencing and, and letting people experience. And then, yeah, you learn. You learn by doing. So that's my tip. I, yeah. But also chemistry knowledge It's handy. It's handy, yeah, to know, uh, you know, essential oils, they are all different. I mean, the oils from the, the citruses they are uh, more volatile, so they go quicker. Uh, and the, the, the trees, the oils of the trees, they stay longer. So you need to know a little bit about notes. Yeah. Uh, a, a perfume is built up on different notes and it's good to learn which oils have which notes and then it can help you with the blending because if
it, it's, it's just, yeah, it's really different. Um, I never, I can tell honestly, I never used synthetic ingredients. I, I never went there. It doesn't interest me. I'm interested in the fully oil plants because they, yeah, uh, totally different effect. But um, I don't think it's true that with fully botanical ingredients you cannot have uh, a longing and a, a, a perfume that stays long because there are beautiful uh, oils that uh, are uh, natural um, uh, how you call that uh, they keep this the scent yeah 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 but you have to know you have to know and this is by doing a lot by blending a lot and then you learn uh, how the oils work. So that's that's the tip I give you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So my struggle is not so much uh, synthetic versus uh, botanic. Um, I'm very much annoyed by by the alcohol content. So I think it's very sad that you can hardly buy perfume these days. At best, you get eau de parfum. Um, so what, what is your take on, on solvents and, and where do you get your botanical solvents from? Um, we use, a, yeah, I mean, we do use an alcohol, which, which yeah. is, yeah, yeah, you have to otherwise, uh, yeah, it doesn't, but it's an alcohol made um, from organic wheat. So in that, I try to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, use the best one there is, but you cannot do without. And you can, uh, yeah, to to let the the scent stay longer, you can use kind of uh, plant glycerin. This is also a, a solvent that we use. Um, yeah, that, that, and if if it's. If it's perfume on the skin, you can also uh, use oil, and then I mean the fat, uh, the fat uh, oil uh, from plants as a base. So then you don't have to use any alcohol at all. Yeah. And, and you use a spray dispenser, or do you sell perfume? Well, what we do, we um, we um, actually don't put perfume in a bottle. We we take it out of the bottle. We put it on, on scent architecture. That's what we do. And you can, um, if you later walk into the barrel storage, there is Omnia, and there we used uh, rock crystals as a, as a carrier for the, the perfume, and it works perfect. It will give the perfume slowly into uh, the room, yeah. So yeah, we, we yeah, we are a bit pioneers in this. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Um, yeah, so the company decides to use uh, um, so the senses uh, to uh, release, uh, relieve stress, uh, for more focus or whatever. How, how does it work? Uh, so, do you use the installation there? Do you have a special installation? Uh, do you use maybe some, I don't know, so decoration that is already the, there? there? There are different techniques to this. Um, this is the Omnia on on installation that's here, right at the Kazan. It's the, the basis is the quartz crystal that's the carrier of the oils. The oils are dripped onto the crystal and the crystal works as a perfect diffusing technique. Why? Why? Because uh, the, the surface of the crystal is rough and um, the, the oil, the, the, the oily substance of the essential oils that we're using um, don't fall off the crystal surface but they are contained by it and the crystal has a uh, very high density, so the stone doesn't soak up the oils, so it stays on the surface. And one of the great um, effects of the uh, quartz crystal is that it 
gives the perfume to the air like a really good diffusing tech uh, uh, installation would do. We experiment with natural materials all the time to find the next diffusing object or uh, 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 wood grain or, or stone with a certain density to act as, as if it were a, a diffusing system. Um, that's also part of the nature all botanical approach that we're trying to use as much as natural materials in our installations as well. We have different techniques. We work together with a company that does the, the, the technical side of the electronically diffused systems and they put it on the air conditioning or um, 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 air, uh, air clearance. Uh, uh, <laughs> Channel, channels, yeah, yeah. So there is another way to do, but this is a, a, a more natural and has a bit more grace than a plastic box with a small uh, fan on it. Yeah, we like to design. The, the company is built on the four of us, and Shaq is the artist and designer. And um, yeah, we like to keep ourselves busy, so we design every installation ourselves, and it comes out of the workshop out of the perfume workshop, out of the, uh, the, 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 the monumental design workshop. Um, the effect of using this in a working environment um, to go back to science and scientifically proven is that it uh, increases productivity on the work floor between 16 and 20%. Uh, so that's really that's really a big deal, and you see a lot of companies are uh, approaching us to make something tailor-made for this special uh, division of the company. And uh, you can't steer the personal effect, but you can create a very good context where people feel comfortable working under stress, have more focus. It's proven that in schools. Uh, children uh, seem to absorb much more information when they're in a, a, a healthy uh, olfactory environment. Um, so it, it's, 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 it's really improvement on a lot of levels that you can focus better, that you have, don't have the burnout feeling you have after a long day of working. You can cope with stress a lot better. So you're, you're just connecting to nature, actually. It's, it's that simple. But it's a different than putting a plant next to your desk and hoping that you can't feel stress when, <laughs> when you look at the plant, for instance. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I cannot really pinpoint a question, so um, <laughs> I just get into it. Uh, so we are living in a time where yeah, a lot is digital and mm -hmm. we are bombarded with all these digital messages and news and yeah, everything is digital. Um, and digital in itself doesn't have smell. Mm -hmm. So everyone is looking now for a way to make digital stick, to make digital also a memorable thing, a memorable experience. Mm -hmm. Is there any research done or do you have any experience uh, on, on how smell can also affect digital experiences? At this point, they actually um, at this point they actually have like this. Uh, they call it a nose. It's like a um, an electronic device, a, a super um, um, computer actually that um, they think is uh, going to be like big in in the world, but it actually can only smell synthetics. So there we have the same problem instantly again, because uh, we are human and we just can process that information. So there's like this uh, thing going on in the world with, with scents and, and smells and how can we uh, send this and how can we uh, um, uh, build spaces that, that are really uh, compatible to, to this, but it's based on a world that doesn't exist. So that's quite complicated at this point. But it's, it's actually there. Um, 
but it doesn't work yet. So that's kind of what ha what's happening at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's so multi-layered. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, 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 I get that. Botanicals have sometimes like 100 molecules, so it's not possible. So you still have to come to experience it <laughs> on, the, uh, on the place. <laughs> I think that's one of the uh, reasons that we haven't looked into the digital um, transition or the digital communication regarding this kind of olfactory information because part of the magic is being there in this place and um, I don't know if you read the book uh, David Byrne wrote on how music works which should uh, be called how everything works um, and he said the personal experience is one of the things that becomes magic again because I kind of watch a concert looking at a YouTube channel but it doesn't say anything to me if I haven't made the memory there when I was there looking at the artists with my daughter or my wife or you name it. We've created something that's especially our personal magic memory there and I can not stream that, I can download that. It's too personal and you're not, yeah, the, 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 you have a lot of art installations that that I call immersive art now, where you can literally dive into and everything that surrounds you is part of the installation. Maybe that's a good example of, maybe there's no need to digitalize this yet. <laughs> when, you can, when you can really have the life experience and digital can be a life ex personal experience. So I think it's an interesting question though, but, but we never looked into it because it doesn't have a really, it's not the focus that we have on building these contexts about well-being and health. Um, but it, it's definitely the future. Yeah, but as you say, as I, I, I find that interesting also. They're now looking for ways to um, make these in-person experiences greater mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. to look for, for the ways that make the in-person experiences better than the digital experiences. Mm -hmm. And so far, I haven't experienced like smell as an enhancement mm -hmm. in like in a mainstream uh, kind of way mm -hmm. or uh, not outside of okay a clothing store has a specific smell that mm -hmm. you remember mm -hmm. um, but other than that there is not that much I feel. As well, again, um, what's happening is is uh, I'm sorry what's happening is actually uh, uh, she told us about the left br uh, left side of the brain and the right side of the brain actually works the same with synthetics versus um, botanical perfumes uh, the botanical perfumes have their impact on, on the right um, part of your brain and the synthetic is on the left so they actually cannot cooperate with each other so you do have a memory uh, on synthetics, but there's just like um, a recognition of something that you have learned before. Um, when you use botanical perfumes, you actually have a physical response to that, and that is proven. Uh, and that just doesn't happen, and it's not possible at your left side of the brain. Uh, so and that brings me to your question. Because you didn't have that emotion now, for now, until now. And that is actually where we went wrong again, because the synthetics can do that for you. The, bot the botanicals uh, can do that, but the synthetics or mixtures, uh, yeah, you, you, your brain is not into recognizing that. It's not the system, it just doesn't work like that. Thanks a lot. You, you have to walk through the Omnia, yeah. if, if you can tonight. Any more questions? My question is a little bit technical. Uh, uh, and uh, You use some fruits and vegetables, I think. And uh, what about uh, extraction methods, uh, getting some concentrated? Yeah. 
the, yeah, there are different, the, there are different uh, methods of getting the essential oils from the plants, so the volatile oils from the plants. The most used is steam. That's the, that's the secret, steam distillation. So you have the plant material, and they, there is steam coming through, and the steam will take the volatile uh, components of the plants, and then they, they, they cool it all down, and then uh, it will become liquid again. And because most of the uh, essential oils are lighter than water, they stay on the surface so they can tap them off. That's the most used uh, method. But then there is also, like from the citruses, you have, if you peel an orange, uh, there's always a little bit of liquid coming out, or a mandarin. This is the essential oil. So the citruses, they are, uh, the extracts are taken by pressing, cold pressing. And then there's effleurage, like in grass, they do with the, with the, the, the uh, sensible flowers. They put in grease and they give off their scent to the, to the, the grease and then it's a, a extracted with alcohol. So there are some different uh, methods um, and uh, yeah, that's how they, uh, they, they learned this already like, um, uh, I think the, in, in Arabia, they already um, uh, learned this like 500 past Christ that this distillation method is uh, used. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any more? No? Okay. Well. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Thank you. So, thank you, Eve and Patricia, for the talks. Um, for now, uh, I want to tell you a couple of things. One is uh, Patricia and Eve and some other people from some are also staying for dinner because uh, there is every week there's a special innovation cafe uh, dinner where you can join up and keep talking about the subjects that have been discussed. Um, so we have an innovation cafe special, which is a meat, fish or vegetarian or vegan dish. Um, meat and fish for 17.50 or a vegetarian or vegan dish for 15 euros. Um, so if you want to join that, please let me know. Uh, I'll also do a little round when we're having some drinks. Um, so next week's program, we have a special guest from Ukraine uh, that are talking about a specific project that they're uh, setting up, which is basically trying to create a really big innovation park uh, and an innovation ecosystem in Ukraine. So they're going to come and talk on what the challenges are about that, which is going to be really interesting. Uh, there's more information on that on the website, which is www.ehvinnovationcafe.org and, and there's also the rest of the program for the rest of the weeks um, so we hope to see you there um, and like I said if you know any interesting initiative that might be interesting for us to show here let me know as well uh, for now I want to invite you to come to the bar with us and maybe go via detour via your little space um, maybe you can guide the way in a second um, and please bring your glasses with you and we hope to see you again next week thanks